project, the Living Beehive, is an utterly unique structure. There's nothing like it in the world. It's a large living art installation. It's a traditional Zulu beehive hut made out of modern steel, high technology architecture, um, covered with a living ecosystem of indigenous species to KwaZulu Natal province. And it really is a symbol and an inspiration to all of us about a future um, that deals with climate change. If you look at the beehive, you look at the old ways African people used to build their hearts, was this design. And then now you are looking at the natural environment and the engineering and the new technologies. If you look at the two, it does make a point that the innovation and the natural capital are key to achieve sustainability. Therefore, the beehive itself, it brings life to the debate. It brings life to the hope that we all have around the discussions on climate change. See, I, I, I want to celebrate this living beehive because it draws on the deep indigenous knowledge, but it actually says it doesn't belong to the past, it belongs to our future. And part of what brings us together here in Durban in COP17 is that link between what we need to do for the future. This beehive is about what we're capable of being and what we're capable of being and what we need to be capable of is living at one with our environment. And in our celebration of what we're doing here this evening, wow. we need to call that to mind because that responsibility is not something that exists in our heads. It exists in what we see, feel and touch around us. And there is nothing that we see, feel and touch around us as our biodiversity is. It's what we must engage with because it's fundamentally important to successive generations. Many of the efforts in this country, many of the celebrated efforts in this country, in fact, speak to biodiversity. Working for water does. Working for wetlands does. Working on fire does. And we need the agency to be able to drive this on a continuous basis so that all of our country, all of our biodiversity is reclaimed. And that is why Sunbi has such an uh, uh, important role to play. You see, those of us who gather to negotiate actually don't represent our jackets or our egos. We are there to serve the best interests of the people and we should never forget that. Despite the many difficulties, let us prove that we not only know where we are Biodiversity is a complex uh, a concept which includes species, includes ecosystem, includes the way human beings interact with that. And it's a difficult concept to pass over. What for me is so obvious is in a country like South Africa, which has the third most mega biodiverse country in the world. So we talk about financial capital, we talk about human capital, uh, but we don't talk about natural capital, nature which is actually the basis on which all our development must be. Because these plants are not fake. This is a real plant and then they are alive. As you can see now and then we have to irrigate them so they can keep being alive. Yes. Hi, my name is Mbali Kopega. I'm the coordinator for the Working for Wetlands program in Guazulu Natal. The key message of the Living Beehive is that healthy ecosystems are able to support people cope better with the effects of climate change. And when one draws that to wetlands, it basically means that wetlands that are in a good health are able to provide the many goods and services to society. And when one thinks of biodiversity, one has to acknowledge that wetlands are a critical part of our biodiversity. 
without wetlands holding water and releasing it slowly when we need it, we will not have enough. It's only wetland systems that are in a healthy, fully functional state that will be able to mitigate against some of the impacts of, of, of climate change. You, you walk into a wetland and it's degraded and you can either walk away or you can, you know, with a little innovation say, let's do something here so that some of the functionality gets restored. The area that we're standing on is called um, the Clanespan Wetland. It's one area of the larger system, which is the Mkuzi floodplain wetland. Before this area was uh, put under conservation, it used to be used for agriculture. And when wetlands are being cultivated, they are drained. What you see these guys doing is they are removing a large earthen beam. Get this soil where it's not supposed to be and move it back to where it was taken. We make it flat so that it also does not, you know, interfere with, with the movement of water. We are also concerned about job creation. The guidelines that come through with the funding is that we need to strictly employ local people in the groups of people that are employed on a project in a particular year. There is 60% women, there is 25% youth. Another big impact, which in my opinion is even more valuable, is the fact that they're doing rehab on an environment that's benefiting them. So in, in the long run, um, by being involved in the fixing of Janeche Pen, for example, they've secured a resource for fishing. And for as long as the river comes down in flood, you know, they will fish and their children and their children's children. And there are many other resources that, you know, they, their wetland on the communal side in particular provides. And for me, that, that's how I look at it. And I think it's, it's you know, the long-term impacts are even much bigger than, you know, the short-term financial gain. And it's based on the on the on the Zulu traditional beehive, and the Zulu traditional beehive was uh, uh, made from natural resources, twigs, uh, plants, and weeds, and so forth. Did you ask uh, the grooms and the brides why they like it? What kind of uh, symbol uh, this did means for them? Happiness, sustainable wedding. <laughs> 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 I must say I'm quite, uh, I'm quite interested in the concept of uh, the uh, living beehive because when I, when I read the description, you know, it's abstract enough for basically get to, to get people to pose and try to, to, to basically come up with their own interpretation of the concept. And, uh, and I started finding this concept extremely interesting because you have technology, and there is no way we are to address climate change without technological breakthrough. But at the same time, there is no way we can address climate change without ecosystems. So you need the ecosystem for both mitigation and uh, adaptation. And the idea that technological breakthrough will enable us to bypass ecosystems is, uh, is, not, is a major fallacy. And at the same time, this is being basically shaped with traditional culture. And this is also extremely powerful because we know that uh, a lot of the knowledge that we will need is already there. It's already with communities. And it will be extremely important to codify uh, local knowledge, to codify indigenous knowledge in order to be able to adapt and find appropriate solution uh, to climate change and ecosystem conservations. And there is no way we will address climate change if it's not in line with the aspiration, long -term aspir short term and long term aspiration of people. So, in the concept of uh, one beehive, you seem to have uh, captured three dramatically important uh, dimensions of climate change. 
now that the debate about green economy is gaining momentum and people are looking at different projects, um, it has always been interesting that biodiversity and, and ecological assets have not necessarily occupied the central stage. And I think there is now a shift, you know, because how green can green jobs be if there is no clear focus on ecosystems, on, on biodiversity and ecological assets as a basis for, for amongst others, to deal with the issue. Mm -hmm. So if you think about any uh, immediate and quick uh, response to climate change, uh, to strengthen our, the resilience both socially and, and culturally and otherwise, uh, a focus on protecting our ecosystems, strengthening them, um, focus on biodiversity, uh, building a whole range of, of services around that is what probably we can do easily. For a long time, wetlands were viewed as being swamps in areas that no one needs for anything. The whole world did not have a grasp on the benefits of wetlands and I guess that is why um, there's so much degradation which continues even up, up to this day. You will see stock grazing you know, all around this place, particularly in seasons where the grazing areas are a bit dry. But the other advantages for downstream users, and a whole lot of those people rely on water, you know, from wetlands for various things. They drink directly from, from rivers and pens. They fish from rivers and pens. They harvest, you know, resources for craftwork, for building houses from rivers and wetlands. So nani lolo was near Zulisa Manja and it's selling a name. Okay. I would say I make a footy manch. Ting tato cool. Conangs and gig mamma lestilla. All right. Wetlands are of benefit to everyone, whether you live in the city or live in the rural area or have a wetland in your area or don't. If you are drinking water from South African systems, then wetlands should be your concern. We are in the age of adaptation. I mean, it's not that we want to stop the mitigation, but if you think about this, we have 7 billion people on Earth as of Halloween. We're going to have 9.2 billion in four decades. We're going to double our demand for food, energy, and water to feed the 2 billion new people that will enter the middle class in 40 years. We're going to increase fossil fuel consumption in that same period by 70 percent. And that means that we are in the age of adaptation. and we. And the only way to adapt is to be resilient. That's what resilience is. And resilience means genetic resilience, biodiversity, and healthy ecosystems. So we can't solve this problem. We can't solve this problem unless, I mean, the climate change problem, the adaptation issue, unless we have healthy ecosystems. And that's biodiversity. There's no country. No country in the world, no politician is going to be successful if they don't use the natural resources or the environmental services coming from nature as a way to achieve their social and, and economic targets. And this is something that uh, I think in the last three, five, three years uh, we have increased dramatically uh, the understanding, uh, creating the links, the flow in information, and above all, uh, making the case uh, for nature conservation as a, as a major driver for economic growth and poverty alleviation. It's an issue of development, uh, and as such, is the, is the way we do business, the way we produce, the way we consume. And I think that climate change is probably driving us towards the big transformational process. Uh, where we are transforming the way we produce and consume into a more sustainable way, in, into green economies or low carbon economies in, in, the, co in the context of our well-being. And I think that uh, in, in, in this process, in this context, nature um, plays a major role. Well, nature gave us this endowment fund called the natural capital, 
And as such, we need to be very smart in how we can use it in order to achieve those uh, very important political objectives. Mkozi flood plain plays a major role in supplying fresh water to the downstream areas. And most people would know that Isimangaliso, which was previously called St. Lucia Wetland Park, lies downstream of the Mkuzi flood plain. And when the initial proposal from Ezenvelo came through to Senbi to get uh, the Mkuzi wetland flood plain rehabilitated, there was the flag objective. We need more fresh water down in the St. Lucia system. But it also plays another role of, of filtering sediment. Senpi believes that if we can restore as much of the floodplain as possible, then we will improve its ability to, to filter most of that sediment. That's right, it's a color good Usula Lamplan, South Africa for me is one of those very special countries that has that wonderful beautiful mix of nature, culture, people, natural capital, wealth, spiritual values which uh, will enable us to achieve some very important targets in sustainability. South Africa and a few other countries in the world May, may do the leap forward, may lead the process, and will help us understand how it can be done. I really do think South Africa um, has potential to utilize its biodiversity to everyone's uh, benefit. Firstly, South Africa is a biodiversity-rich country. And if, if we stopped degrading our, our environment and, and found ways of using it to everyone's benefit, then I think we really have, have a good chance at, at, at getting it right. But like I say, it requires resources, um, both human and financial, and it requires um, quite a lot of education and, and awareness. But I think with the combination of all those, we can get it right.